Hey, what's up? It's Vince here again. Now you got a bit of power, my friend. We're bringing out the, uh, the Skyline because I was using the Fleet Line in the previous uh, tournament that we left off on in the series. Skyline is a better handling car because of the tuner class that it is, and the Fleet Line was the Chevy Fleet Line was just all over the place. So I need a car I can handle. Even though the top speed's down on this car because it's a B-class vehicle or C-class vehicle, it can do 250 with a shot at us and top out around uh, 220 around that point. And uh, we're doing like a Nissan Quest prototype. It's like a Nissan concept car for the Niss um, tournament. And I've also included some extra footage as well later on in the video. That's why it's so long. But we grinded the tournament reversing faster cars. And we gotta just make do with what we have. Because there is a lack of power compared to these higher class vehicles. If we have Skyline is uh, C class. We're just getting our footing. Uh, just getting our footing getting grounded. Getting a grip of how the car handles in this first race. I didn't do any driving around the city, but you gotta throw yourself into the races in order to really um, understand the car and what it's gonna do around the uh, tracks that we have that are laid out here. Of course, in this some person racing for or something like that. Either way, it's like, yeah, sure, it's cool, but then once you know the concept cars like a Nissan Quest or a Nissan Versa, after 2007, 2008, when I think came out, it's like, yeah, it's kind of dull. Because I know what it looks like, but you know, it's a concept, it's cool, because you don't know what it's going to be. Here we just mess around with the slow motion a little too much. Abusing it a little bit. It's got that inline six high pitch, but yeah, deep V8 grumble at the same time. A lot of baritone mixed with uh, alto. Creating this kind of car sound, you know. Skyline's got a 2.6 liter RB26. It's a very high pitched screen, borderline F1 sound. I can rev to 8000. Definitely not an accurate engine model, though. The muscle cars are just generic V8 sounds. But you know the Skyline scream when you hear it unless it's been bored over to 3 liter or somebody's using an RB30 swap or 2GZ swap and it's a little more bare tone in the sound. Whereas 2.6 liter inline 6 just has a unique harmonious sound. Like a motorcycle or something. Skyline R34 GTR being the last of the uh, 90s group of cars with BNC R32, BNC R33, BNC R34 chassis coats of the 1990s, even though they, they brought them back. Like that's the BNCRs go back to the RB30, the R30. There was an R30, R31, but they only had GTS, GTST, GTSR, EAs. They have their reputation for Bathurst and Australia circuit, but when the GTR R32 came out with the four-wheel drive, it just decimated everything. We had a four-wheel drive vehicle that can put the power down and scream from mid-range all the way to the top. It was geared appropriately with that five-speed transmission doing 160 miles an hour on Bathurst. Really gets its reputation out. It's also the most aerodynamic out of the 32, 33, and 34. 34 is kind of a brick, but it's also the movie car. It's the kind of the thing that holds up its prop as being in a bunch of movies, media, stuff like that. Even though the R32 did all the dirty work and the 33 carried over to model years and sold units. And it was the more pra most practical skyline out of all the uh, 90 skylines. 33, having, you can really sit f four people in there. This is the longest wheelbase, probably the most stable at high speed. All of them do like 170 miles an hour, they never do 200, though they're geared to do 200, 220 miles an hour with the, uh, the ratios that they got in drive. V spec being the, the performance spec, M spec being the comfortable. There's even more work spec ones for the R34, they're soft suspension designed if you go around the track. 
when the, when the purple 1, 2, 3 started in 33 and went to 34 for all those colors. Nismo has their hands on special models from the 32 to the 34, all the way from 89 to 2005, about three years after the R32 was discontinued. I'm sorry, the R34 was discontinued in 2002, but they made the Z2. Two, 10 units until 2005. Nismo sold the one in New Zealand that they had for a substantial amount of money. R34 is also coming in high amounts of money in the United States, exchanging for $150,000. I believe there's only 10. Could be more that are here illegally, meaning that they're not illegal until 2024 due to federal emissions and safety standards that the car is not required for. The car does not meet, obviously. Because it was lied to by the Mortec or something, or I forget uh, who tested the scouts and imported them. But they were a great market importer in California, and they passed off the 32 as a 33, 34. And when the U.S. government got a wind of it, they uh, shut them down. I forget the name off the top of my head. But it was a scout a great importer, and uh, imported 32, 33, 34s during the 90s. Anything that was imported in that time was safe to be in the United States because it already was tested. You can legally have these cars for show and display purposes if it's registered to be used for show and display purposes. You can only drive them 5,000 miles per year. Or some ridiculously low number. And drive the car shows them back. Though in states that have loopholes like Florida, you can register anything and it just flies under the radar pretty much. It's one of those street fiends that you guys know about. Even though there's written rules and stuff, Florida's been a gateway. People import them still. If they know a friend or know people in Japan, and they can import them. When it becomes legal, though, I think that the uh, hopefully the, the six-digit price will come down. Like it will be around twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and then fifteen thousand dollars, like the R32s are, depending on the condition and if they've been modified or not. The unmolested examples that hold the most value are as modified ones go down to zero as close as you can go to zero, even if they might be faster. But the 34 is the ones to get as part of the most stylistic looking car, whereas the uh, 32 is still holding on to the 80s, the 30 degrees, kind of a st kind of stepchild. Uh, it's between the 33 and the 34 for me. Obviously, the 34 is the one everybody wants, but the 33 still holds merit. And it'll be illegal in the United States soon for importation. People are just waiting to pull the trigger on this. It also overshadows a lot of rare cars like the JDM Supras that exist, Evos, uh, RX 7s that were. JDM spec only, Subaru 22Bs, Impreza Prez STIs, the UK Subaru Prezas, UK Evos, used for value uh, racing, like the Tommy Mac version, Subaru 22B, Subaru, Subaru Pro Drive P1s, they hold the merit as well. Good MR2s were still made for years after they were discontinued. From the United States. New Scout has been milked to death, starting from 470 horsepower to now 600 with their uh, 2020 concepts and 100th anniversary special editions that they have. Or this updated R35 with the uh, softer suspension and more luxurious interior. It's kind of defeating the purpose of what it's trying to compete with the Corvette or base 911. That's what I thought the GTR was all about. But I don't know. Things inflate over the past 10 years that the car's been out since 2007. It hasn't really changed. You're saying it's going to be a hybrid. Uh, yeah, that's going to be an RNSX. I mean, yeah, the NSX is an appealing car from a technological standpoint with the new hybrid uh, NSX, but it's just it's just dull, kind of mundane. It doesn't really 
just looks like a car that fits the role of what it is and kind of rides off the Ford GT a little bit because the Ford GT came out a little bit earlier with the flying buttress design and yes, it's kind of imitating that. Anyway, the Skyline rides and drives well in the game. You cruise around 220 and you need to use the NAS when you need to. It'll do is go as fast as a supercar in the game. If you can get HKS parts, that'd be the most authentic thing to do. But being that you know, I'm stuck in America or whatever you want to call it, you know, you're limited by the market you write best by. Um, going to US uh, tuners and modifiers trying to keep things locally to keep price down but the HKS stuff you know best of the best or any JDM parts that have been discontinued in the aftermarket granted they still make parts for this car but just have like an authentic time period piece of a modified style with 600 700 horsepower 600 700 is a good number to keep the stupid thousand horsepower theoretical number is just a money pit to dive into because then you just have a completely different car rebuild the engine and reinforce it like an M1 spec block which is a lot of some of the people that know about it the RB26 is that the motor shakes itself to death between 7 and 8,000 RPM so you need some reinforcements in the block some gusset even or something like that on a block the M1 spec like more webbing plus the iron and materials are stronger in M1 spec blocks compared to regular GTRs or you even find an M1 spec block you know you just roll the dice trying to find an original one more or less is that if you want a thousand horsepower you can either put an LS motor in or you can buy a house for the amount of money you want to make a skyline go that fast. The reality is 300, 400, maybe 500 horsepower is the most feasible out of the, uh, the engine that it comes with. And the 2JZ is more, it's a wider market, bigger after market, bigger power potential even. And the most I've seen out of an RB26 was 1200. Supers are chucking out, or 2JZs are chucking out 2000. One thing I also like to see in Skylines is the LS motor shoehorn in them because it gives it like a American Japanese hybrid vibe, you know, American firepower with the Japanese style. And the note fits the car pretty well with the styling that it has with the body kit and the aggressive aero. Nissan know their tuners, man. Look at this. Going to be real big in the tuner scene, the sport concept. Enjoy! They gave in the Sambersa, or whatever it is, or Quest. <laughs> uh, that was kind of dead end for this time right there. They're promoting that and not a GTR in this game, which they were promoting in 2005 for Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo gets everything first, they're Japanese. Polyphony Digital is Japanese, so they're closest. They can take the trip over instead of Rockstar having to fly over because they're based in America to get a view of the GTR concept, which probably should have been in this on car in the game. That's the, I mean, it's gotta be like dream cars. Dream cars sell no matter how old they are. Now here we're going to do more independent races from now on for the rest of the video. We got um, this car and I think I switched cars later in the video, I'm not going to reveal until then so, but um, this is the, a good bulk of the game is just picking random races and it reaches to a point where um, you're, you're just doing them just to knock down the percentage of the Tokyo Challenge. Now, as you can see now that I switched to a regular race, I'm now outclassed by supercars, which is kind of weird. The game just all of a sudden goes into die hard mode or try hard mode or whatever, because you, you go further along with the Tokyo Challenge, then it becomes a challenge to uh, whip out the supercars. Taking a classic Tokyo shortcut right there. 
never used that in Miller Club too, but we just used it there. I gotta get on the other side of the road. The highway is a lot darker in this game uh, compared to Miller Club 2, I noticed from playing the games back to back. But it adds that grittiness look to it, like, Miller Club 3's got a very gritty and dark look. Very rap music video type deal looking. It's very dark, very flashy at the same time. Whereas in my club too, just rolls with the aesthetic and the limitations of what they had at the time. Whereas this is really the end of the PS2's life cycle they're pushing in. This is like borderline Xbox 360 launch title. But if it didn't have like the greatness, grainy look to it, it would probably be considered to be a really Xbox 360 game. Or PS3 game. Though the Xbox version probably does look better than the uh, PS2 version, which is what I'm playing. The Xbox usually takes out a lot of graininess and has a little bit further of a draw distance because it's like more powerful console. Uh, you can see like San Andreas videos where they compare the two games from the PS2 to the and the just Xbox to original Xbox. So you want to want to play with that controller, that big bulky controller. I never used it, but it just doesn't look very comfortable. And you see it's just getting slaughtered by the AI, it's just doing 250 miles an hour, and there ain't nothing much I could do about it. gonna happen with the skyline. I decided not to edit it, just to leave like a what goes into it type footage. Gives me more time to talk about the car instead of skipping stuff. And there's still hours worth of footage left of the game even though I'm halfway through it. Though a big bulk of it is just doing the random races so I'll make the most of it doing that, but this is the raw footage of what it takes to get you to Tokyo Challenge. It's a game within a game. And I want to show that on, these, on this channel. Make sure we're showing everything. I did skip and cut a few things here and there in the beginning, but we're just going to get more serious about it and uh, just finish it properly and show everything. I'll talk a little bit about the Lamborghini Metro Lago here right now, so... Obviously, this is a four-wheel drive vehicle, very easy to drive. It has great stats. It has an Achilles heel, though. Achilles heel. And that's if you uh, go in the slow motion mode at full speed and you try going to the corner, the car will roll because the grip, I guess, gets cranked up to 9,000%. And it just causes itself to flip over. Whereas the tires are just magnet going around the car, pulling G's. And the car just rolls over in slow motion at 200 miles an hour and there's nothing you can really do about it other than try to counter steer or you gotta actually slow down for the turn. So the big advantage is that there's no slipping and sliding, there's literally no wheel spin, it's a very straightforward car. However, when exiting slides you lose a lot of time because it seems like you gotta fish for a gear to get back into. And this correlates with all-wheel drive cars being tricky to launch, tricky to put the power down, tricky to shift gears in uh, in real life. So I guess that's what they were going for, or it's just how it, how it is. But the Merchant Lago is a childhood car in the 2000s. If you know what it is. People may think it's sedate because it's owned by Audi. Lamborghini was owned by Audi, which is owned by VW, and they kind of sedated the car from the Diablo when you compare the two back to back. This thing does not compete with the Diablo in terms of looks, though it is a faster car. 6.5 or 6 liter? 6 liter V8, and I think they up to 6.5 or 6.2. 550 horsepower from 2002, and they cranked them up all the way to 640 during its lifetime. 
nowadays 750 is the standard in the new Aventador SV so that car is very angular, it's got a different engine this is the last of the original engine that goes back to the early 60s in the original Lamborghinis the engine was originally 3.5 liters and they just bored and stroked it for 4 years the same block and everything, an added fuel injection this is like one of its final forms being in the Lamborghini Merchilago as a modern day supercar. Merchilago stands out as being in between the price of hypercars and just normal sports cars like your Ferraris, Aston Martins, just normal range Porsche 911s. It just stands in between that and exclusive one off hypercars like the Porsche Carrera, SLR, McLaren. This could compete with those cars, but. It, it's obviously a more mass-produced vehicle. It doesn't have that special appeal, and they made them for a very long time. Even though they didn't make many of them, it just doesn't. It just feels like the generic big Lambo that fits for the, the 2000s. Saying that I can't afford a Lambo, but when you when you look at the market and, and where the car fits within the automobile hierarchies of sports cars or hypercars just stands in the top 75%, it's not the, the pinnacle or the 100% like a car like the Bugatti Veyron Koenigsegg, something that's really just all out aggressive would uh, sit and it's just not. And then we can used to always have the stereotype of being the car you used to go to the club and pick up women or something and be a real, I don't know, fishing net for clubs or something like that and not really driven car can go fast around a track, but I don't think it's going to be as enjoyable as a real drive car like a Ferrari 360 or 430. And I remember from watching reviews that if you exceed the limit, the thing's going to oversteer and just spin out. Which is weird. Yeah, that one's for the DeVille. used for five seconds in Batman um, The Dark Knight for like five seconds because it was crashed into and that was a 640 this one's just a regular Mercury Lago I believe before they started coming out with like the 610 the 640 and the SV and stuff like that or the five the, I think it was like five the 550 then 570 then they jumped the 610 then they went to 640 in terms of horsepower that's how they just lay it out the LPs really started with this car and the Gallardo from modern day Lamborghinis there was never any LP 550 or dash 4 all these code names stuff that's very Germanic we got a Lamborghini Diablo it's essentially Italian it's just the Lamborghini Diablo and then VT or SV or whatever special model there's no numbers involved like these German cars do which make it very null you want a name on a car not a, not a code or some computer arithmetic on it it's not what cars are about so the Mercer Lago name will still stand out as being in bad videos though the event there is the car now of the decade being that this is 2019 and we're probably coming towards the end of the Inventador production cycle being that they dropped the SV now. So it's now to see what the 2020 uh, Lambo is. It'll probably probably have 100 more horsepower, or maybe starting at 800. I'd like to see the next Lamborghini just go out and just say standard Lamborghini, big Lambo. Big V12 Lambo is going to have 1,000 horsepower, standard. Because that's the norm these days, it's just 1,000 horsepower vehicles, whereas back in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was only 450-500. And it stayed that way for a good 30 years, from like the late 60s up until the late 90s, because of the emissions and the emission standards that came in, and the gas crises that came in kind of hang there but even though if you wanted to go faster you could you could still spend the money and do that but it was, in factory production cars it just wasn't happening unless you're talking about exclusive exclusive I'm sorry exclusive tuners like Cowway 
rough. Uh, any of the JDM tuners like Nismo Spoon. <sighs> Other stuff. <laughs> any dealerships that would just put on bolt on parts or go fast stuff on it from the factory. Or going on the other aftermarket yourself and building something special, you know, something that's built for racing, or for a category or something. I like how the V12 roar on the Lamborghini is different than most V12 cars. It's more of a roar and a symphony rather than a scream. Compared to smaller V12 cars, the Lamborghini. Lamborghini's always gonna have that big V10 uh, roar, yeah, V12 roar. Best way to buy the car would be to buy a crash one and uh, fix it and save the money. Be less than buying a used one or something sold by a dealership. It's the best way to go about it if you're smart, but most people that can afford Lamborghinis don't uh, aren't willing to work on cars. Don't have the time or patience or money or even care to do it. So, but you see YouTubers do it every so often. The people that uh, know what they're doing in the car flip market or taking their personal time from their experience to uh, make things happen, pretty much. The can-do attitude still exists in America, which is good. The craziest car I've seen that's like and has flood damage or war damage is like a McLaren F1. I saw it one time it's being sold for like a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. Car's been sold, I don't know who has it, but that's a rare piece you got right there. When you scan the forums or online car sell selling websites or anything like that, you can find some real nice stuff or nice potential. It's always the hard part of doing it, that's uh, what holds a lot of people back, they start things, don't finish them. The only thing you finish is your work and that kind of eats up a lot of time. It makes you want to do your things in your own time, which is really the point of life. It's just a matter of getting there, if you've been there or not or understand what I'm talking about. And there's the full example of like taking the car too fast and the car rolls. That was a full 90 degree turn that went in way too hot for, for what the car can handle. The Selena 7 wasn't doing that. And there's obviously better options in the, uh, the garage from what I have to choose, whether it be a 911 or a, or Jimbalo, I'm sorry. Or the McLaren F1 or Mercedes SLR or. Even the Pagani Zonda that's featured in this, we'll get to that car later and talk about it for a bit, but um, that's going to have its own video when I get around to it. But first we'll finish the series, or maybe I'll create the video, whichever comes first to mind. Right now we're doing the commentary for this. And you see I took a beating damage, and this race was... Uh, Again, I hit myself, but this race was a pain. I had to do it multiple times, but I featured it anyway, because you could see the issue with the Lambo. Just keeps flipping over. It's like an inherent problem. Yeah, it's the best car in the game. You win in the Detroit race, but what you can buy. This is the best prize car you see. It's the car that's given to you. It's not a car that you can buy. Like the McLaren or the SR McLaren or Selena 7. The cars that you can buy have their different stats and are at the price for a reason. They handle better. They're not a handout. So this car is a bit of a deception in this game. Everybody likes to think that a Lambo's fast. But is it really fast? There's just more technical cars out there than just this artistic form of stuffing a V12 into a car and doing this crazy body work and calling it a car. Even though I know there's a lot of engineering and stuff with like modern day standards that it has to meet and crash tests and safety stuff. But in a nutshell, it's just. Uh, I'm criticizing a Merchel Argo. And I don't know what else to say. 
I'm just into the more technical cars. Lamy just seems like a go-to car for someone who just who just got rich. Even though there's like old sayings that would say the opposite for those who've been rich have Lambos, whereas the Ferrari is just an upstart. I think I think they're both the same. They go hand in hand. I think that people that don't know about cars or don't look into them enough just buy Lambos because it's just the first thing that comes to mind from society. This is one of the default metallic uh, or color shift colors. It's like a yellow. It's like a gold and a, and a light blue mixed together to create this color. And I thought it went very well. This is one of the few cars that I messed up or so I'm speaking priced out. I only write down like maybe one or two cars. I like solid colors a lot more, and that's what this game allowed you to do. Whereas Underground, Underground 2 forced you to write it out in order to get points or something, or get look points or something. And nowadays it just looks disgusting, like you want to vomit or something. This jump always sucks too, like, because if you're off, you're off, and then that's the end of the race. I just went through the map and no clipped. But you have to lift the throttle or brake in the car as fast in order to do it. So there's a lesson for you. The cars are too fast for the track. And I think that cars were never meant to go this fast on a Midnight Club 2 map. Because the most you'd usually do is like between 180 and 220, whereas in this game you're doing 230, 250 at your finest hour. On a straight like that, on that straight where I crashed and lost, I was doing the full extra 20 miles an hour, and I think that that has a big impact on uh, me losing the race. Because this is obviously a Midnight Club 2 map, and you have to let off, whereas the cars in this game go a little faster. Granted, you can do 250 in Midnight Club 2 in the fastest cars. But at that point, you're just deliberately trying to fly off the map. Some crazy driving flying in the buildings. The funny thing is, too, is that the AI will follow suit because they're trying to keep up with you or rubber band in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, we'll get through this race, we'll do a couple more, and I think that that's going to be um, the end of the video for now, so I got a couple more races to do in this video. Uh, check them out, I talked about the cars, I'll talk about more things if you want. Uh, views of the series dictate on how many vi uh, videos I put out for it, though I'm at the halfway point, I'll eventually finish this. I will probably start a new series related to an air game or have some other type of form of video coming soon. It's just a matter of um, clearing up stuff and having the time to do it. Making time to do it is always important. Like how I'm making the time to do this right now and I'm tired. A little bit tired, not 100%. I'd say like 50%. Kind of like a daisy. Like, I'm awake, but I'm dozed off a bit. Just talking about or ridiculing Lamborghini Merchilagos. I don't know. I don't, I don't find the car as attractive as the Diablo. I just don't. The Diablo's got more oomph to it. Even though it's a rounded out car, this is more angular. The Diablo's got that Italian flair. Especially the early 90, 90s to 95s. 1990-1995 with the wheels that had and the little splitter and the, and the crazy colors like black or like a audacious orange, green, or red, or yellow. Some crazy power color. Like the early 90s Diablos. Even with the pop-up headlights, that's just, ne that's just Italian. Though in all reality, I'd be a little more sedate and get like the late 90s Diablo, like the 98s. 98 to 2002 
people have already killed his Reiner and ZX headlights, but it makes the car look more streamlined. And the wheels help out too, they put bigger rims on them. And they are also the most powerful ones, so it's kind of a win-win. That's the thing of Lamborghini as well, is that usually the last models are the best models of, a, of whatever model they make, like the Mirror, the JV models, that have uh, like borderline race cars, the Countach LB5000s, with the wide bodies, those are the best ones of the Countach, Diablo SVs, uh, Diablo GTRs, Mitchell Largo SVs, Mitchell Largo GTR race car, even though that was kind of a one-off deal. LB640, 610s. The earlier ones are always cheaper. Gallardo LP 570 or the Valentino Balboni edition. The top models right now the Aventador SV or Aventador J. Aventador J stands out. But yeah, enjoy the rest of the video. I'm gonna upload this and it'll probably take a million years, but we'll get it up on there probably the next day or something like that but this video's done see you in the next one